Good morning, Greenville Springs. Good morning. Welcome to Fifth Sunday. We're going to bring it back and do a couple of old songs from the faith. Let's stand together and worship the Lord this morning. Sing it out. morning. Good well, good morning, morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Lee. How you doing? I'm great. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh-huh. Come on now. That's Come kind on. of puny. Come on. Yes. Amen. There we go. Right. We're getting a turn in there. Well, look, if you're a guest and you came in this morning, hopefully you received a bulletin. If you did not, we have some out in the foyer. But on the bottom of that bulletin, there's a place for you to fill out just a little bit of information. Put that in the offering plate when it goes by in just a few minutes. And on the flip side of that is a place, if any of us in this room has any type of prayer need or we know something that someone's going through and we want to just... Lift that up to the Lord, and you want more people praying for you. And on that, do not forget about our prayer clinic that takes place right across the hallway in the connections room. So at the end of this service, if there's something that's just weighing on you and you need to actually speak with someone in a little better detail, we have folks over there that's willing to, to go to the Father with you on that situation. Huh? Huh? Right. That's good stuff, All right? right? Amen? Good yep. things are going yep. on. All right, so what you got? A couple tell us. of things coming up. Uh -huh. There's the deadline to get signed up for Father's Day parent child dedication. Okay. All right. And the offices are closed tomorrow. All right. That's and, awesome. That's awesome. But guess what we're rolling toward? What's that? Camp. 
camp. Camp's coming up. Camp. We're Summer not camps. The camp. Yeah, we are rolling the camp. But the boy. most exciting thing. Yep. It's so close. Vacation Bible Vacation School. Vacation Bible yes. School. Woohoo! If you went yes. through the foyer, you see that it's all decked out, and we are super excited about what the Lord's going to do here in just a few days. I know I'm pumped. Are you pumped? We still have room for you to be involved. Yes. So see Ms. Miranda out at the table yes. outside. Even if it's just a little bit, we make this easy. Ms. Miranda's got this so organized. You can come do a little or a whole lot. We're going to be decorating all this week. It is going to be so exciting. Yes, but not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Somehow or another, we do not have to work tomorrow Thank goodness. on BBS stuff. That's First right. time in forever. All right, so look, if you're having issues signing up online, we know that some folks are, and we do really apologize that you're having issues registering either yourself or your children for Vacation Bible School, please take advantage of being here today. Yes. And also, in the four-year area, not the welcome desk, but over there by Miranda at the VBS table, we have the actual papers, old school way, mm -hmm. that you put your name down and your child's name. Let's do that. Let's get them logged in today. Miranda will take care of all the computer stuff. You just get your child or yourself registered today. And I don't know if we said this or not, but workers, um, we do need you, but not to teach. So you don't have to worry about if you go see Miranda, she's going to put you teaching first graders. or No, you'll just be there walking with the children, and if you can count to 20-something, you're good to go. No, if they can count to about 10 or 12. No, we need a buffer, 20. They need to at least get to 20. We try but to it, keep the those important thing small. is if you count 22 when you walk out of that room, you go into the next room and you down to 19, you need to find the other three. Yeah. Okay, so you that's why we need you. the same number okay? all the time. That's why we need you. And look, also, I want to plug this real quick. If you would like to be a part of our adult vacation Bible school Bible study that's going to take place in the coffee shop, and I'm not going to lie. When I'm running through this place during VBS, I am jealous of that room. I am jealous of that room from the snacks, the dessert, the breakfast, the, the brunch. I mean, they eat the nonstop. Crowd. Oh, yeah, they also study. Yeah, no, but um, God moves in a great way in that coffee Amen. shop as well. So this is a fun week. So I encourage you to get involved. I'm going to stop yapping because we can go on forever about this. Amen. We're looking we got an amen on that? Okay. All right, well, look, if you do not mind, please direct your eyes to the screen, please.
This is Memorial Day weekend. It's time set aside when we remember our war dead, those who gave their lives fighting for freedom on foreign soils. Originally, Memorial Day was known as Decoration Day because some women after the Civil War went to the graves and decorated the graves with flowers and with flags. And so we remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. This morning when you exit the auditorium through the middle doors there right to the left is a fallen soldier table. And I would encourage all of you, particularly those of a younger generation, to read what is on that plaque describing the different elements that are part of the fallen soldier's table to remember what they have done for us to enjoy a day like today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come in remembrance. We remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice through our military, who have fought for freedom for our nation and the rest of the world. We thank you for their sacrifice, for their example to us, and how they reflect the ultimate sacrifice of Christ who gave his life for the sins of the world. Lord, on this day, we also, as we think of those who grieve and mourn loved ones who served in the military who have fallen, there are some families, an entire community, Uvalde, Texas, grieving the loss of their children. Those 19 precious babies and the two teachers who lost their lives in a horrible school shooting. And so, Lord, as we remember and consider the grieving of those who've lost soldiers, those in the military, we remember these families, the parents, the grandparents, the entire community, as they are grieving as well. Lord, also, we remember those in the Ukraine dealing with this war with Russia. And Lord, so many have lost their lives and people have fled the country. Lord, we pray for those grieving as well. So Lord, we, we remember and we grieve with those who grieve, weep with those who weep. But thank you as believers, as Christians, we grieve not as those without hope. We have hope because Jesus laid down his life for his friends. The greatest sacrifice ever made for all mankind. But he rose from the dead. So we know there's hope. The hope of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for those who have gone before us and have paid that ultimate price. And thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Let's stand together and let's just continue to sing about that love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows and made them his very own. He bore the to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior. 
shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. Come on, turn. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Thank you, Lord, that you took our sin. Amen. Real quickly, we're, I'd like to do a responsive reading. So it's basically just uh, saying together scripture. I'm going to start us off, and then you'll follow as the choir leads. Um, it's called This is Love. And because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. And it is by his grace that you have been saved. And everyone says... Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. Man, isn't that good? The creator of the universe allowed himself to be nailed through the hands and feet because of his love for us. And it's love that we don't always understand, but uh, I'm just so thankful for it, and I believe it with all that I am. And so this morning, let's just sing of that love. Oh, how he loves you and me.
Amen. The uh, Holy Spirit of God brings unity in the body of Christ. That's what that song is about, of us being together. We're one in the Spirit. And, you know, we, we need to let the Spirit of God reign and rule in our lives and in our church. Amen? Uh, here's the thing. We don't want to grieve the Spirit. We don't want to quench the Spirit. We don't want to resist the Spirit. What do we want to do? We want to obey the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. I know it's a Baptist church, but we can talk about the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, we want the Holy Spirit to lead us even in our giving. Before we have our offering, our boys and girls get to go to kids' worship. And I think you're going to meet with Miss Denise, and she's going to take you to see Miss Denise. And y'all are going to have a good time together worshiping Jesus, talking about him. All right? So, kids, come on. Yeah, can't wait to get there. That's good. All right. Wonderful. All right, here we go. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, running after Jesus. Amen. That's good. Okay, good deal. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning and we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. As we reflect on the sacrifice of, of those who have given their lives for freedom, for our country, for our nation, we reflect upon the sacrifice of Christ from freedom from sin and free to live life as you called us to live it. And when we consider his sacrifice, nothing is too much to give back. And so, Lord, we want to give back to you and to your work for the sacrifice of your son. And, Lord, most of us never sacrifice, but we want to at least give back the tithe you require in your word and offerings for your work to go forth through out this world that people will know about Jesus who makes the difference in life and eternity. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
All right, uh, we're t singing about, they've been singing about the precious blood of Jesus, the powerful blood of Jesus, the cleansing blood of Jesus, the saving blood of Jesus, amen, amen. I'm glad you're here this Sunday over this Memorial Day weekend, what a special weekend it is in our nation and a time of remembrance and glad you could participate in it with us. Uh, those of you that are guests and a reminder to our church family, I'm in the midst of a sermon series on encouragement, encouraging words from the Word. Listen, there's so many things that can discourage us today and so many discouraging words. It's good to have an encouraging word, right? And our theme verse is 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore encourage one another and build up one another. And that's what I'm trying to do in this series. Uh, I shared uh, three weeks ago a study that was done by Southern Methodist University a few years ago trying to determine what people are looking for in life. Do you remember that? There are three things people are looking for. They found the top three in this order. Here they are, if you bring those up. Uh, three things people are looking for in life. One, three things people are looking for in life. Yep. They're going to be there. Ah, number one, people are looking for love. They're looking for, remember the second one? Happiness, and then the third one they're looking for is peace. Now, I dealt, I've dealt with them in uh, the reverse order. I dealt with how to find peace last week, how to find happiness, how to be happy, and then this week I'm going to talk about love, and it's a very fitting theme with what we're dealing with in Memorial Day, uh, the love and sacrifice of those who've gone before us. But, you know, love is a major theme throughout history of almost everything you think of, music, poetry, art, literature, books, uh, even movies, television programs. I mean, love is the theme, is it not? And uh, one of our old hymns says, of all the themes that we have known, the one supremely stands alone. And what is it? It's love. Love. 
Listen, love, there, there was a book written uh, a few years ago by uh, a man named Henry Drummond. He was a pastor, and he wrote a book entitled, actually it was a recording of a sermon that he preached from 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest thing in the world was the name of the sermon, the name of the book, and the greatest thing in the world, what? Love. Listen, let me share with you. The greatest thing in the world is love because the greatest commandment is what? The great commandment is what? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is likened to what? Love your neighbor yourself. So the greatest commandment, the most important thing we are to do as far as what God has told us to do, the greatest commandment above all commandments is to love God and love other people, right? Okay, it's also the greatest virtue or the greatest quality of life. Why do I say that? Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, it ends like this, now abide faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is faith, hope are good qualities to have and good, good uh, virtues, but the greatest of these is love. And then uh, it is the greatest evidence of a disciple. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you do what? Love one another. Also, it is the greatest sacrifice, which we have learned today. We've seen it on the video. I've shared it. I've prayed it. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man do what? Lay down his life for his friends. So see, it is the greatest thing in the world. It's the greatest thing we have. The greatest thing we know is love. I'm going to talk about love. I mean, people are looking for love. They're, they're trying to find love. They need to be loved. I mean, it is one of the, the basics of our makeup. In fact, it is, is first requisite for, for, uh, for health and for living, for, for, for mental health is to be loved. Listen, the world at best has an incomplete view of love. Most of the time, they have a perverted view of love. Is that not right? We're going to talk about love. You okay with that? Love. You can spell it L-O-V-E or L-U-E-V. Love, okay? Talk about love. We're talking about God's love, really. John, the apostle, was known as the apostle of truth, but also he was known as the apostle of love. You know why that is? How did he designate himself in the gospel of John that he wrote by being led of the Holy Spirit? He designated himself in a particular way concerning love. The disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, Jesus loved all of his disciples, but John was especially close. Remember, out of the 12, he had an inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. But then the very closest to him, likely because he was the youngest, and we know he loved him so much because from the cross, Jesus gave the care of his mother to this one. Who was it? Behold your mother, behold your son, John. And so he was very close to John. So John was the apostle of truth, but also the apostle of love. And we are to speak the truth in love. And I, I try to do that as a pastor. I try to speak the truth in love and keep those together. Now, the passage we're going to look at, if it was the only remnant, piece, fragment of the Bible we had about God's love, we could understand his love. It is the closest to the greatest treatise on love, the most beautiful, wonderful, inspiring words ever written about love are 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind, uh, love not easily provoked, all of it. It's just a wonderful chapter. I speak with the men, uh, tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I'm nothing. It's great. But this is the closest we have in Scripture, I think, in, in, in all of literature that speaks about love. And so we can know God's love through this passage, God's redeeming love and what, what love is all about. And I'm going to talk to you about how to experience love, how to know love, how to find love, how to experience love today. Anybody interested? It's the need we have. It's the number one need. The number one thing people are looking for, looking for love, how to experience love. First John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. If you find that passage, then would you stand with me in honor of God's holy word? Or if you don't have a Bible, look on with the neighbor or look on the screens. The verses will appear there for you. 1 John chapter 4, toward the back of your Bible, 1 John, it'll be right before what? 2 John, that's right, okay, 1 John, then 2 John, then 3 John, all right. And not, not the gospel according to John, that's on the front side of the New Testament, but this is toward the very back of the New Testament in your Bible. All right, we're at verse 7, uh, about God's love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God for, I want you to say these three words with me, God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. 
Not that we loved God, but that what? He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, what? We also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Say these three words with me again. For God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love does what? Cast out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love why? Because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful passage about your love. What love is and how we're to practice it, how we're to live it out, how we're to experience it ourselves. I pray, God, that I will be able to communicate from your word about love today and that no one would leave this place not knowing that he or she is, is dearly, clearly loved by you. And, Lord, we have an obligation then to reach out and show your love to others and help us do that. I pray your spirit speak to our hearts through your word about love today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. May God add his blessings and power to the reading, preaching, teaching of his word. There are 46 times in the book of 1 John that love is mentioned. And it's a small book, a short book of five chapters, but it's very interesting that of the 46 words for the love that is mentioned 46 times, 27 are in these 15 verses. So it's chock full of love here and what we need to know about love. So here's what I want to tell you. God calls us to live a life of love. He wants us to be, our lives to be characterized by love. But what did I tell you? The greatest commandment of all the things you're to follow and do is what? Love God and love other people. Love God on the, the vertical plane. Love other people on the horizontal plane. So how are we going to experience love? Well, I want to share three things with you from the text that I found here. And uh, here we go. Number one, how to experience love? You must recognize the source of love. You got to know where it comes from. Where does love come from, brothers and sisters? Where do we find God? Well, let's go to the text. Our beloved, let us do what? Love one another, for love is from God. The sense of the original language is originates from. It comes from Him. It's not from us. We don't make it up. We, we don't conjure it up. It's not from the flesh. It's not from human beings. It's not from other people. Uh, love comes from God. And because look what the Bible says. Everyone who, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love, what? doesn't know God. For, there it is, God is love. Now, God is more than love. God is holy. God is just. God is righteous. God can be wrathful. God is all. But aren't we glad He is love? Because if He is just holy and just, we're toast. Because for God's holiness and justice, we're going to die and go to hell. But He is a God of grace and a God of mercy and a God of love. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Aren't we glad? If not, we're in trouble. But we have the opportunity to know him because he is love. That is the essence of his being as far as who he is. He is love. You know, he's holy as well. He's just right all those things. But he is love. How do we get love? Where do we get love? From God. Romans 5, 5 says this, the love of God, now listen to me, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by his spirit. It's appropriate. We sing about the Spirit of God. And I spoke about the Spirit of God during the offertory because that's where we get God's love. It's poured out in our hearts. How? From where? Who does it? The Holy Spirit of God pours out God's love into our God is light. God is spirit. God is consuming, a consuming fire. God is 
wise. God is holy. God is just. God is good. But God is full of grace and God is God of love. Now, we have one word for love pretty much. And you say, you can say, you know, I, I, I love uh, crawfish. Or I love bluebell ice cream. Anybody love bluebell ice cream here? And you can say, I love my wife. Now, hopefully those are not that same level, okay? Because if they are, we're all in trouble. But love, that's what we do. Now, see, in the Greek language, they had at least four words for love. Three we have in the New Testament. One we don't. One was eros. Have you heard the word eros? It's from which we get the word erotic. The word means sensual love, physical love. Then we have philia that most of you have heard before. The city of brotherly love is Philadelphia. Philia is brotherly love. The one we don't have in Scripture that was in Koine Greek and that, that the common language of that time is storge, which is the love a parent has for a child. But the one more of you are probably familiar with than any of the other words is the word agape. Any of you heard the word agape? Agape is God's love. Now, it originally was not that. It originally, in the uh, Greek language, it's called classical Greek or Koine Greek, it meant high esteem, to hold someone in high esteem and to have great respect for. But here's the thing. There was no real word that could describe God's love. And so Christians basically took that word, infused meaning, greater meaning into it. You know what agape means? It means self-giving, sacrificial love, unconditional love. That's God's love. That's agape love. Aren't we glad we have that word now of God's love, agape love that he gives us? And also we see it comes from God, but then what are we to do with it? We recognize the source. But what are we to do with it? We're to love other people. And when you love, you have your desire for the best for another person. You want the best. So God loves us. He wants the best for us. He loves us so very much. And we then are in turn to love others. And love does not come from us because, you see, it, it, it's hard to really define love. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 describes love. It's, one of the most, again, the most beautiful treatise of love, description of love. But when you try to define love, I mean, the best way I can say is Jesus is love, and the cross shows God's love. But from a standpoint of us and how we deal with it, the best word I've come up with for love is selflessness. Not selfishness, that's the opposite selflessness. In other words, you don't think of yourself, you don't care for yourself, you care for another person more than yourself. Or you don't think of yourself at all. Now, the world has a hard time doing that because what's the world about as far as love? Love yourself and take care of yourself and get all self can get and it's all about yourself, it's all about you. But God's love is all about the other person. God gives his love to us and shows his love to us, he manifests his love to us. He is love, the source of love. Go to uh, verse 16. We've come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Or again, there it is. Verse 8 and now verse 16. God is what? God is love. In other words, we can't create it. We can't make it. We are not the originators. We are not the creators of love. It comes from God. That's how you able to have love, you know the source of love. And that's how you can experience love, how you can give love, is you know the source of love. I mentioned ice cream a while ago. Anybody like ice cream here? Anybody like ice cream? Man, I love ice cream. Man, sometimes you can get homemade ice cream. A week ago, we had a crawfish boil in one of the Sunday school classes and made some homemade peach ice cream. Oh, man, it's incredible. Crawfish boil and homemade peach ice cream, man. Is it getting better than that? But uh, the closest thing to homemade that I've found is Bluebell. Now, when Bluebell started in Brenham, Texas, it was just in a few select areas, towns in Texas. You couldn't find it in any other state. And then after a while, it got so popular, they began to branch out. There are some places in the world, though, that are still without Bluebell. Sad, sad for those people. It's so sad. But I had never heard of it. I was in seminary at Southwestern Seminary. Uh, going to school as a minister, and a buddy of mine, we had eaten supper, and he said, hey, let's go get some cookies and cream. What? Cookies and cream? What do you mean, man? He goes, you know, Bluebell. I said, cookies and cream? What's Bluebell? He goes, Nick, you don't know what Bluebell is? I said, 
man, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, okay, we're going to, well, we had to go to a specialty shop. It was called the Back Porch, and they had a bluebell that you, they would dip out of the, out of the big, uh, what do you call bins there, you know, the containers. What? The tubs, there you go. That's what I'm trying to find. I love to talk for a living. All right. So, t- now the tubs, vocabulary, you know, it's good. So, the tubs. And so, man, I- I'm telling you, I got cookies and cream, bluebell ice cream. I was hooked. I'm telling you. And so, let me tell you what happened. Periodically, we lived, the guys lived in the dorm, the men's dorm there at the seminary. And periodically, what we would do is we'd go find where bluebell was, particularly if it was on sale, and we'd get it and we'd tell the guys, bring a cup and bring a spoon. And we just get a half gallon, and everybody come in because we had no refrigerator or freezer. So you had to eat it all right there, man. So we would do that. So here's the thing we would have, where do they have Bluebell? Where are they selling Bluebell? I mean, we would check out the stores going around. The, you had to find the source of Bluebell to get it to come enjoy it. Well, I want to tell you something. You don't have to be looking around for God's love anymore because He's brought it to us. Amen? The source is God. He gives it to you. If you're looking for love, you come to the right place. If you're looking for love, you've come to the right place because God gives you his love. Amen? That's where it comes from. It comes from God. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to wonder. I want to tell you something. God loves you. 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 Aren't we glad God loves us? Amen. He loves us. And so we don't have to worry. In in my day, there was a song, and one of the lyrics was, looking for love in all the wrong places. I want to tell you something. Here's the right place to find it in God's church with God's people, God's love. Amen? Okay, so first of all, if you want to experience love, know love, find love, you recognize the source that comes from God. Number two, then we are to love. We know that. So realize why we should love. Why should we love? Well, there's a couple of reasons that we should love. Let's let's go to, uh, I, I kind of skipped over verses 9 through 10. Let's go ahead. The one whose love was manifested in us. God commended his love in that while we are yet sinners, demonstrated his love towards us while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not good getting better, bad getting worse. God demonstrated his love. And this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and has sent his son to the propitiation of, his, of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So because of God's example of his love for us, we are to love other people. Let's go to verse 19. Kind of jump over to the end of the chapter. We love why? Because we're just loving people. No, why do we love? What does the Bible say? Verse 19, we love, why? So the first reason we're to love is because God has shown us his love. He's demonstrated his love in Christ. Who's that? That's a heavy-duty theologic word. He's the propitiation for our sins. It means atoning sacrifice. Literally, it's a covering. And that's when we talk about the blood of Christ covers our sins. Some think that's a little, little gory to talk about blood. But see, life is in the blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, no forgiveness of sin. Because the Bible says the soul that sinneth it must die. The wage of sin is death. Somebody's going to die for sin, and life is in the blood. And, and the Old Testament had the sacrificial system of lambs and, and turtle doves and others, other living beings, oxen and, and cattle, and they would, they would be sacrifices for sin. What was pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice would be Christ who would shed his blood because life is in the blood, and sin costs you what? It costs life, and it brings what? Death. But Jesus came that we might have life. He became the provision. And when you read uh, verse 9 and 10, they kind of sound like John 3, 16, don't they? A little bit. Well, only begotten, precious, one of a kind. Well, Jesus, the only begotten. Well, it's John who's writing this, led by the Spirit of God. And so it's going to sound familiar. So we, we love because of God's example. He told us to love. But also go to verse 21, the very last verse I read. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. This is the what we have from him. What does it say in your Bible? Command. What's a commandment? It's an order, a law, you're to follow. And so we're commanded. Didn't I say, didn't I share with you earlier? You know this. The greatest commandment is to what? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we're commanded to love. So we have the example that God has shown us through his son, and he's manifested, demonstrated his love, Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, but also we're told to love. And so if you're not loving people, you're, you're not being obedient to the Lord. You're being disobedient. Now, let me ask you this. Are there some people that are difficult to love? Hello? Don't name names, please. Don't do that. 
don't be punching somebody beside you either, okay? Some people, are they not hard to love? But you know what I found? The people that are the most unlovely need God's love the most. I'm telling you, and they're the most difficult to love. I mean, sometimes they're about driving you crazy, but they need love. And that's part of the deal. They don't know love. They're not experiencing love. And so that's why they're out of control or they're negative. Or did we talk about negativity and critical spirit last week? People that are not happy. Yeah. So anyway, people are like that because you know what? They don't know love. They're not experiencing love. They don't, they don't feel or sense God's love, and they don't. And sometimes they don't experience the love of other people, and we need to love them. And, and see, listen, we don't have a choice. It's like forgiveness. You don't have a choice. You have to forgive people. Isn't that right? And if you don't forgive, what does the Bible say? God won't forgive you. That's a pretty serious deal. And so we are abound. Now, forgiving and loving doesn't mean you, 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 uh, you minimize the sin against you or the pain they cause or anything like that. You don't have to become the best friend if somebody has, if it's to the level of extreme of molestation, something like that. You don't, but you do have to forgive and try to love. And let me tell you something. There's some people that in my lifetime, I cannot love. Preston Nix cannot, my flesh. You know what I have to do? Let the Lord through me love them. I have to let the, is anybody hearing me? You have to let the Lord, because some people are just unlovely. They're not, they're not, they're not easy to love. But you know what? Again, that's when people need love the most and we're loved. I've shared this before on Wednesday night. I've shared it a couple of times, and Hadley always remembers this, and he reflects it back to me. But I had a, a crazy guy in my church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He, I mean, he really was kind of edgy. Diane can tell you. He was, he was a wild man, and he would, he would come to me, and he would say this. He said, Preacher, I love you, and you can't do anything about it. And he would do it in front of people. He'd do it all the time. So I love you. You can't do anything about it. So basically what he was telling me is no matter what I say, what I do, how I treat him, he's going to love me. And you know what? He was expressing the way we ought to be with other people. We ought to love. Preacher, I love you. And he would yell it across the auditorium. I love you. You can't do anything about it. I said, I love you too, bud. I love you too. You know, and everything. But you know what? That's the way we ought to be. I love you and you can't do anything about it. You know what we ought to do? Love him back. Amen. We ought to love. And so we're to love. So if you want to experience love, you recognize the source. It comes from God. That's where you get love, by the Holy Spirit pouring it out in your heart. And you recognize, you, you realize why you should love is because God has shown us his love, the ex extreme example. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man do what? Lay down his life for his friends. We've quoted that. We've seen it on the video. I prayed it. So we're, we have God's example and then God's command that we're to love. It's the greatest commandment. But let me go to the third one. If you want to experience love, you can receive the benefit of love. Receive the benefit of love. All right. Let's go to uh, verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. His love is perfected in us. It shows that we really are his children, that God abides in us, that we're able to love. By this we know we abide in him, he in us, because he's given us his spirit. That's how you know you, you have Christ in you. The Holy Spirit of God comes to reside in you. We've seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, everybody's not saved until they trust in Christ, turn from sin, invite Christ in, but availability. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We've come to know and to believe the love which God has for us. Again, God is love. The one who abides in love abides in God. God abides in him. Now, look at this benefit. By this, the love of God is perfected. Now, it doesn't mean you perfectly love or you're a perfect person, but it means that it's, the word means complete or being matured, growing, is perfected, moving to perfection with us so that we may have, look at this, confidence in the day of judgment. Do you know that God's going to judge the world one day? Do you know that we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God? Now, here's the thing. We won't be at the white throne judgment, hallelujah, praise his name, because we will be condemned. But the Bible tells us in Christ, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when we stand before the Lord one day, judgment day, my old daddy used to call it doomsday. We have doomsday, judgment day. We will not be judged. We will be rewarded according to our works. And he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We'll enter the kingdom, enter into our rest and into glory with him. Isn't that wonderful to know? Hallelujah. Especially in the day and age in which we live and all this going on and everything around us. Aren't we glad that God's going to wrap this all up and whatever happens to us, we're going to go to heaven one day. Hallelujah. Praise his name. And so the benefit of love is we have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. We're in the world, but not 
of the world. And so we're like Jesus, and the world hated Jesus. Guess what? They're going to hate us. But we still stand up for him. We love. See, we both have the same goal as Muslims and as Christians to conquer the world, to win the world. They're going to do it by the sword. We're going to do it by love. We try to reach out in love to people, even those who hate us and come against us, even those who would want to chop our heads off, literally. But we show, need to show them God's love and reach out to them. There is no, Look at this. There's no fear in love because perfect love does what? The sense of the Greek there is you pick it up and throw it as far as you can. Cast out. We, we could almost, you can translate it. Kicks out, throws out, gets rid of it, gets it out of the way, out of the house. Cast out fear because fear involves, if you're fearful, it involves what? You know what's going to happen to you. What is it? Punishment. You fear because you're going to be punished because you've done wrong. Your sin. See, in judgment, you know it's going to be bad. But for us, we have confidence. We can stand there. Hallelujah. Not, not, not being brash or not being arrogant. We're just saying we're not condemned. Hallelujah. We're not condemned. And so we have what? The word begins with a C. Confidence. We can stand before the Lord and have confidence because perfect love casts out fear. I have found a lot of people fear a lot of things. And there are a lot of things to cause fear, but some have unrealistic fears. You know what the word here in the Greek is from which we get our word phobia? Phobia. And people have a lot of phobias. I mean, I had an administrative assistant, secretary one time, that was fearful of crossing any bridges or overpasses. So you can know her travel was limited. <laughs> it's so funny, later in her life, she became the leader of the senior adult travel group. <laughs> Finally overcame it, but she couldn't do that. Some people have a fear of elevators. Have you ever been fearful of elevator? I didn't until I got stuck in one between two floors at a hospital one time. I'd had no fear before, but all of a sudden, it stops, and I'm there, and I'm by myself, and I hear nothing, and no button will work, and I'm going, oh, my soul, I'm going to die in a hospital <laughs> in between floors <laughs> in an elevator, not even any elevator music, just silent. And then I heard a worker say, hey, man, I think somebody's in that elevator. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the door opened up above me, and a guy was looking down at me. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry, man. I said, that's okay. I'm glad to see you, buddy. I'm glad to see you. So I'm okay. I'm over that fear now. But I had a fear for just a little while, just a fear I wasn't going to get out there alive. I mean, people have fear. Now, on a serious note, people have a lot of fears. There are fears of arachnophobia, fear of spiders. There are fears, but there are fears of being found out. Fears that somebody's going to know what you've done. Fear of the past. Fear of the future. There are all kinds of fears. Some of you fear what's going to happen in the life of your church in the future. There are all kinds of fears, but see, perfect love does what? Cast out fear. Rather than focusing on the fear, oh God, get rid of the fear, get rid of the You can pray that, but let me tell you something. It's better to say, Lord, let me experience your love. Flood my heart with your love. And when you experience God's love and know God's love, guess what? The fear can't remain. It has to go. It's about like this. Any of you ever seen one of these little things? A little, that goes with an adding machine. What do you call that? Um, adding machine tape. There you go. Okay. So you put that in there da, 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 like that. And there's a hole in it, so it fits in the little machine, and then it it does that and so you have that but what usually there's nothing in there but I got something stuffed down in there so we don't need that in there so what do we do well I'll take a little pencil here a little golf pencil I push that in there and guess what happens out comes the obstruction out comes that which is so if you put love of God in where there's fear guess what they can't coexist one will replace the others. Anybody hearing and seeing? Perfect love does what? Cast out, push out, shoves out, gets rid of fear. And so what I'm telling you, my friend, whatever you're fearful of, whatever fear in your life, let me ask you 
to seek the Lord and request His love to flood your heart, to flood that area of fear in your life. And when the love comes in, are you hearing me? When the love comes in, the fear goes out. Amen? So I want to encourage you to experience God's love. Know God's love. It moves the fear out. Famous quote from a famous lady. I think the biggest disease the world suffers from in this day and age is that of people feeling unloved. Does anybody know who said that several years ago? Let me read it again. I think the biggest disease the world suffers from in this day and age is that, that excuse me, a people feeling unloved. Anybody know who said that? It was a person who had everything the world has to offer. She was considered one of the most beautiful women in the world. She was one of the most powerful people in the world with one of the highest positions in the world. She was royalty. Her name was Princess Diana. Some of you remember Princess Diana? What you think, what, what, what do you mean? The world loved her. Isn't that right? Everybody loved her, and when she died in that tragic car accident, that wreck, people, it, the world mourned. But you know what her problem was? The one closest to her, supposed to be closest to her husband, didn't love her. He loved another woman. And as a result, the person who had every, I'm, I'm talking, can you imagine? I mean, you're talking a princess. You're talking, you have everything that the world has to offer. There's nothing that would be refused you. And she said, what we, I suffer from, she was really given a personal testimony, is I suffer from being unloved. People want love. They need love. It is the first requisite for mental health. You need love. Babies will die without being loved, literally. They will die. They need love. They need touch, human touch. Love is so important, but we know the source. Where does it come from? From God. How are we able to love other people? How are we able to do that? Because God's example, and he's told us to do it, so we do it, and we allow him to love through us. But receive this benefit, this great benefit of love is we have confidence and, and we, we don't have to fear. And, and that is a great benefit, a, a byproduct of love. We love each other. We sang it a while ago. Oh, how he loves you and me. How does it go on? He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. When I was growing up, I learned a, a song about God's love. Some of you remember this one. Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. What? They're precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. But the first song I learned about Jesus' love He's a simple, sweet, basic song about his love. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I know that's a children's chorus, but that little song states one of the most profound truths of the universe. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible 
tells me so. There was a man who was famed for his newspaper reporting and had forged a career but then felt called to ministry. He was a man with great confidence, great writing skill, speaking skill, but he was getting ready to preach his first sermon and he was really kind of beside himself. It's a little different when you're standing up before people preaching and uh, he called his dad. They were very close and he just said, Dad, I, I, I tried to prepare a sermon. I, I just, I, I don't know what to say to the people. And his dad just gave him some very basic advice. He said, son, tell the people God loves them because that's the most important thing they could ever hear. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Oh, he hates your sin. But you know why he hates your sin? Because he loves you. Because you know what sin does to you. He knows what sin does in our relationship with him. What does it do? It separates us from him. And if we stay separated from him, when we physically die, what's going to happen? We stay separated from him. And if you stay separated from him in death, as in life, you end up experiencing the second death, which is what? The lake of fire. The book of Revelation says the lake of fire, hell. But God does not want us to be separated from him in this life. And he doesn't want to be separated from us in the next life. He wants us to be in right relationship with him. That's what it's all about. Jesus came to this earth to bridge the gap between a holy God and sinful mankind. And Jesus died upon that cross and shed his blood. The love of God demonstrated for us while we were yet sinners, not good and getting better, bad and getting worse. Christ died for us. And if you accept his payment on the cross and then realize not only did he die and pay for your sin, what happened? He rose from the dead. He conquered the penalty of sin, which is what? Death. And if someone has power over death, what can they give you? Life. And he can give you eternal, abundant life and a home in heaven. So I ask you, do you know God's love? Have you experienced God's love? He loves you, and you can't do anything about it. But I would encourage you to love him back. How do you do that? Turn from sin. Invite Christ in. Trust in him. I want to give you that opportunity right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed, please. And the reason I ask you to do that is so you can be alone with your thoughts and with the truth of what you've just heard about the sacrifice of Christ and his conquering of death that he brings life Jesus does love you Jesus died for you Jesus paid for your sin Jesus rose again and by his spirit he can live within within your heart the Bible says if you will call on the name of the Lord you'll be saved the only way I know to call on him is through prayer so what I like to do at the end of every service when I preach here on Sunday mornings I give you an opportunity to pray to trust Christ if you have a question mark about where you stand with God or you know that you've never ever truly experienced his love and ask him to come in and take control of your life ask forgiveness then you need to do that right now and this Memorial Day weekend you remember what Christ did for you and you can just leave it there but I tell you I wouldn't just leave it there I would do something about it So right there where you are, if you've never trusted Christ, you have that question mark, let's draw that out to an exclamation point to make for certain and say something like this. You don't have to pray these exact words. Words don't save you. Just saying a little prayer doesn't save you. It's the attitude of your heart and what you want to happen in your relationship with God, but the prayer expresses that, and I just give you that opportunity to express it, to call on Him in prayer. And so something along these lines, would you say, Dear Lord, dear Lord Jesus, Just go ahead and say it to him. You don't have to say it out loud. You're welcome to, but you can whisper to him, just silently speak to him. He's here by his spirit. Say, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. I've broken your laws. Just get honest with God, preacher included. We've all done wrong. We've all sinned. We've broken God's laws. Nobody's perfect. That's why we need the perfect Savior. Say, Jesus, I've, I've sinned. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I want to turn from my sin. You can even use the Bible word. I want to repent, turn away from it, my sin, and I turn to you. 
Then express your gratitude for what he did for you. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sin. Just tell him thank you. Express your gratitude. However you want to say it, thank you for dying for me, dying in my place. And then say to him, Jesus, I accept your payment upon the cross, the shedding of your blood for my salvation. I accept your payment. So right there, first of all, you turn from sin. You turn away from sin. You repent of sin. You ask God to forgive you of your sin. You accept his payment for your sin. Just say that, I accept your payment. I know you died for me. Thank you for dying in my place. And then say, Jesus, I know that you rose from the dead. You're alive and can live in me. And so say to him, I want to ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart. Come into my life. Come in, save my soul. And Jesus, take control. Come in and save my soul. Pray it. Say it. Come in, Jesus, and save my soul. And Jesus, come in and take control. Give me eternal life. Give me a home in heaven. If you ask him, he'll do it. You can say it to him this way. If you didn't catch all these words, the words again don't save you. Just say, Jesus, I receive you now as my Savior. And I will follow you as my Lord and my God from this day forward. And if you just pray to receive Jesus, welcome to the family of God. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy for you. Eternity's changed for you. You're now headed to heaven. You were headed to hell. You say, well, I wasn't that bad a person. Listen, from a human standpoint, you may not have been, but one sin makes you a sinner or a thousand sin makes you a sinner. Sinners separated from God, but now you're a saint headed to heaven. You trusted Christ. You become part of the family of God. You become a brother or sister, and we want to know who our brothers and sisters are. So here's what I do. I give a public invitation. What does that mean, preacher? Well, in a moment, there's going to be singing for the platform. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And I'm going to step down here. There'll be other pastors, other ministers here up front. And we just ask you to come and let us know you've trusted Christ. So, well, I don't know about that. Well, here's the thing. Again, we want to help you. You're our new brother and sister. We want to help you in your next steps in living for Jesus. And also, Jesus called people in the Bible to follow him. And everyone he called, he called in front of other people. No secret disciples with Jesus. Come follow me. And when you think about where Jesus died, he was on a hill outside one of the main city gates of Jerusalem for everyone to see. He was willing to die publicly for you. So I don't think it's too much for him to ask that you stand up publicly for him. He died publicly, humiliated, battered, bleeding on that cross, that Roman cross for you. I just want to ask you to take your public stand for him today. There may be other decisions. Maybe you're already saved, born again, but you feel led to be a part of this church family. Or maybe you're saved, born again, but never been baptized. We invite you to come. Baptism doesn't save you. You're already saved, but it's a, it's a beautiful picture of the cleansing of sin. It's the way you become a part of the church. There may be other decisions, and you may want to come to the altar. Maybe you struggle with fear. Maybe you struggle experiencing God's love. Maybe you want to pray with someone or just pray for your church. God loves you. Jesus loves you. We're so grateful. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to stand to our feet. If you pray to receive Jesus with me, or maybe at another time before this, or maybe you've not yet prayed but want to pray on a personal level, we'll have people that will pray with you. we go to the connection room there. Somebody you can talk to on a personal level. We'll be happy to do so. Heavenly Father, thank you for meeting with us, and I cannot thank you enough for your love. May those that have been touched by your love and moved by your love to trust your son today make public their decision for you, even now, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand together and let's respond to the Lord. Respond to his love, even now.
search me. Is that you'd cleanse me, Lord? Create in me a heart that's clean. Gird the power of secret shame. Come wash away. invitation for this service comes to a close, but God's invitation by His Spirit continues. As He's speaking to your heart, if you have not come forward, or this is a little foreign for you, not used to it, and I understand coming in front of a group of people, but if you want to talk to somebody on a personal level, out this door, Caddy Corner to Cross, is a connections room. It's designated there. There are people there that will visit with you and pray with you and help you with any spiritual decision or any prayer concern you have. So I just want to offer that to you after this service, or you can go out the back and then go around the hallway right over here, all right? I hope you know you're loved. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Amen? Amen? And you know what? I love you, and you can't do anything about it, all right? (laughs) Okay? All right. And I know most of you love me, so God bless you. I'm proud of you. It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord with God's people here at Greenville Springs Baptist Church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and as we pray, I want you to remember, whatever you do in enjoyment tomorrow, if you're out on the beach or you're just in your backyard or in, on the porch or in your house or wherever you are, if you're out of swimming pool, remember you're able to enjoy that freedom because somebody died for you to be free. Freedom is not free. We're grateful for those who have paid the ultimate price that we can enjoy a sunshiny Memorial Day like we'll have tomorrow, like we're having today. Aren't we grateful for their sacrifice? And ultimately, we're grateful for the greatest sacrifice, Christ on the cross of Calvary. Lord, thank you for this weekend and what it means in our nation. And we are grateful for those who have paid the ultimate price. And even though we know we have problems in our nation today, we have freedom like no one else in the world. And we are blessed beyond measure here as citizens of the United States of America. Thank you, Lord, that we can enjoy the lives we live here. And Lord, thank you that we can be free from the guilt of sin the past, we don't have to fear the future because your love cast out the fear of judgment and punishment. That there's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. And one day we will be welcomed in to heaven with you forever. But in the meantime, Lord, help us to live a life of love. Experience no And share your love with others until you come for us at death or come again to rapture your church. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good weekend.